Uh, is it Mueller? Or... It's me, but I'm recording. Oh, hey, oh, hey, are, you, are you also like letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Hey, uh, welcome everyone to Balkan Circle. Um, I know you all like we are thinking about everyone in Ukraine today, and um, I just wanted to post our center statement in support of the people of Ukraine before we started. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, and probably everyone here today does, my name is Mary Newberger. I am a professor of history here at UT Austin and the director for the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. So welcome to Balkan Circle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And yes, uh, in those dark and testing times, uh, which of course uh, require a lot of resilience, support, emotional and, uh, and um, empathy on all levels, we do appreciate the fact that uh, our speaker today is able to uh, talk to us. Our audience, our faithful audience is uh, here today. Uh, so I thank you very much. My name is Kirill Avramov. I'm an assistant professor uh, of political science and I'm with the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I'm also the director of the Global Disinformation Lab uh, at uh, UT. Uh, and I have uh, a great pleasure today uh, to introduce a speaker who will be talking on a very important topic for our region, which is addressing the rule of law in Western Balkans. And this is Dr. Marko Kmežić. Dr. Kmežić is a lawyer and a political scientist working at the, center of, uh, of, at the Center for Southeast European Studies and Institute of Public Law and Political Science at the University of Graz, one of the big research centers uh, with a focus on, on the Balkans. He is the author of several scientific monographs, including Europeanization by Rule of Law Implementation in Western Balkan uh, for the Institute of Free Democracy in 2014, EU Rule of Law Promotion Judiciary Reform in Western Balkans, Rutledge uh, 2016, and co-editor of Stagnation and Drift in the Western Balkan 2013, as well as the Europeanization of the Western Balkan, the failure of conditionality, something very important, which came out from Belgrave 2019. Uh, he also gives expert advice on rule of law for EC and OSCE and the COE uh, to the government's international organizations uh, in the Balkans. So that means that he has this practitioner look, which is also very important uh, when dealing with, uh, I would argue, some of the key issues uh, pertaining to democracy and development uh, in our region and the region of um, Western Balkans. Without further ado, Marco, thank you very much. If I may, uh, on first name basis, uh, invite you to the floor of Balkan Circle uh, to talk to us and uh, later on discuss some of the ideas that you will pr uh, present regarding the rule of law in Western Balkans. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you kindly for your kind words and also for the um, invitation to address the Balkan Circle. It is absolute pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually. Uh, and let me just start by, by endorsing uh, uh, your message and uh, uh, the uh, general sentiment of empathy and uh, solidarity with uh, Ukrainian people and uh, uh, what is actually going on in the immediate neighborhood of Aust the country of Austria, where I'm actually sitting. Uh, but yeah, uh, the grim situation uh, as it is, uh, we still need to uh, keep focused on the actual life, not uh, to forget uh, um, everything else. And therefore, uh, I would actually like to address something else today. And that is the topic of the rule of law in the Western Balkans, in particularly in the context of European integration that is ongoing uh, for already a couple of decades uh, uh, with the countries belonging to these Western Balkan circle of countries. So uh, the, the topic of today's, the structure of today's presentation will be roughly divided into these three um, sub subunits um, if you're following the uh, power, PowerPoint presentation. So we'll be talking about the rule of law reforms in the Western Balkans in general, uh, the deficiencies and main findings from some of the empirical studies that have, that have been conducted in the recent years. Um, also, we'll be concluding on the scope of the rule of law reforms that are driven by the, by the European Union, also depth of it, uh, 
uh, uh, how sustainable these reforms are, and uh, also what are the limits of EU-driven rule of law uh, reforms in the Western Balkans. Um, uh, trying to, to come up with some ideas of what can be done better, what can be done more, and uh, ultimately, uh, do we have all the players engaged into this process uh, uh, to the satisfying level? So before actually getting there, I, I believe that, you know, from my, from my thus far conducted lecture, sometimes it's useful to have this uh, a reflection on the uh, theoretical reflex, reflection on the meaning of the rule of law. And uh, this would be a good starting point basically to, to, for us to see what this rule of law actually is and why is it the interest of the European Union to promote it uh, abroad. And I cannot stress it enough that uh, the rule of law is in fact an ambiguous term and it can mean different things in different contexts. And as an illustration, I always offer this uh, uh, very vivid uh, picture of, uh, uh, if you would ask a constitutional court lawyer uh, from, let's say, Poland, or a constitutional court judge from Italy, or an expert from Germany, they would all give you different inter interpretations of what the rule of law actually means for them. But mind you, they would all be very correct in their own merits uh, because the, the, the exactly the rule of law is this uh, a huge umbrella just as democracies and a lot of different things can be thrown under this umbrella and therefore um, I would I would just propose to adopt this functional definition of the rule of law so not going to the thin and thick definition and uh, what what else but really this functional definition of the rule of law, which uh, says that the rule of law is uh, a mean to restrain government officials in accordance to the law and impose limits on the lawmaking power. And secondly, uh, to maintain the behavior and transactions between uh, citizens. So uh, that, would be, that would be my proposal actually, how to observe the rule of law within the context of the coming uh, presentation which I will have. But um, of course, uh, uh, this being said, the rule of law is also uh, one of the founding values of uh, the European Union, and it reflects member states' shared identity and uh, common constitutional traditions of the member state countries of the EU. And uh, as such, it has been enshrined in the Article 2 of the Treaty of European Union, the founding uh, defining treaty of the European Union, uh, which lists uh, respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights uh, as sh shared values upon which the European Union is rooted. And as such, uh, uh, the rule of law defines the collective identity of uh, the very union um, of all its member states and um, is indispensable as such uh, for, uh, to determine EU's actions, uh, not only within the Union, so domestic actions, but also inter international uh, uh, realms, uh, as well as conditions for the membership to the European Union itself. Um, so a functioning rule of law is therefore um, an important element of the EU's enlargement policy. Uh, and uh, its implementation creates then in return a key condition, political condition for aspiring members to join the Union. And as I have said, uh, the countries of the Western Balkans, uh, hereby, I mean Albania, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia and Kosovo. So they are obliged uh, within their respective uh, EU paths to actually uh, respect the condition of, uh, of uh, implementing functional rule of law within their society. So uh, what the EU does in, in return, it monitors this implementation of the rule of law conditions. Uh, so EU candidates, uh, so candidate countries are in fact vetted for their compliance with the rule of law before they accede to the union. 
However, once they have become member states of the EU, uh, the mechanism for enforcement and uh, monitoring adherence to the rule of law and other fundamental legal principles have pretty much proven to uh, works relatively weak. Uh, uh, and therefore sanctions can be imposed during the accession uh, talks on prospective member country in the case of breaches of the rule of law. And these would be basically the suspension of the ongoing talks for uh, becoming a, an EU member. Um, and also uh, depri deprivation of financial assistance coming from the EU during the negotiation process. But there is still no effective counterpart to such measures after the accession to the EU. And therefore, I'm just going to slightly touch upon this. Therefore, uh, we can now observe pretty much uh, huge problems with regarding, regarding the rule of law implementation in uh, the EU member states, such as Poland and Hungary, which are uh, actually just uh, uh, neighboring countries to the, to the Western Balkans. So uh, what, what I'm actually uh, uh, aiming at is that uh, uh, the rule of the, the EU has devised this uh, toolbox for assessing the respect for the rule of law in candidate countries. And uh, uh, despite of uh, the ongoing process of uh, Europeanization uh, with the six Western Balkan uh, candidate countries, uh, and despite of the fact that they have been exposed to the uh, EU's rule of law promotion mechanisms within the stabilization and association process for already a decade, or in fact, close to two decades, uh, the respect for the rule of law in these countries has declined overall during the past, past decade. And this can be observed, um, for example, in the latest Freedom, of, uh, Free, uh, Freedom House, uh, Freedom of the World report, which observes an absence of the rule of law and increase in patronage networks and clientelism that threaten democratic institutions in the region. Um, and in the same vein, the European Commission itself has in 2018 pretty much step, stepped away from um, the usual diplomatic and soft language they used to describe the situation within, with, with regard to democracy and rule of law in the Balkans and has declared, uh, as I said, in 2018 in its uh, communication on a credible enlargement perspective for the Western Balkans that uh, the countries show, and I'm quoting, clear elements of state capture, including links with organized crime and corruption at all levels of government and administration, as well as strong entanglement of public and private interests. Of course, this is backed up by academic literature that also notes the nexus between the rule of law and democratization. Uh, but the, 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 the actual problem here that we are observing is that uh, despite of uh, this process uh, still uh, is ongoing for over the two decades, uh, it is clear that it does not actually bear fruit because uh, clearly the countries are stagnating or even backsliding in terms of the rule of law. Uh, regardless of these processes. So what exactly is the rule of law mean within the EU enlargement? Uh, uh, as I've listed it here on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, uh, basically there are two negotiating chapters that EU is using to look into the issues related to the rule of law. Those are negotiating chapters 23 and 24. And only once you actually look into them, you see that the EU is focusing mostly on judiciary, uh, so functioning with judiciary, but also fight against corruption, fight against organized crime, fight against terrorism, uh, human rights and protection of minorities, including freedom of expression uh, that also understands uh, uh, press freedom. And finally, border control, visas, external migration, and asylum. Uh, those are the issues that the EU treats as uh, the key for the rule of law. But how does it all play? Uh, instead of actually giving you uh, data from various sources and uh, indexes and numbers, I've decided to do a bit uh, unorthodox uh, presentation by actually looking into cartoons. Uh, these are all produced by a very famous Serbian cartoonist uh, who publishes uh, regularly for various dailies and magazines in Serbia. And basically 
if you look at them carefully, you will see uh, at least one familiar figure that would be the late lady, uh, uh, lady Justice. And the other guy which features prominently is the former Serbian Minister of Justice. Um, and obviously the message uh, that uh, this cartoonist say, says, sends, and sometimes the picture speaks more than actually thousands of words, is that the lady, lady justice or the justice itself is under a lot of pressure uh, in Serbia. And he hints that a lot of this pressure is act actually coming from the political elites um, uh, that are uh, featured uh, within these cartoons prominently in, in the character of the very minister of justice. So the person who's supposed to guarantee for the uh, uh, independence of uh, these institutions that create this functional triangle guaranteeing the rule of law. So courts, uh, public prosecutor and uh, the police. Um, what do citizens have to say about it? Um, well, according to the figures that are gathered in the Balkan Barometer, which is a, an annual exercise uh, conducted, annual survey conducted by the uh, uh, Regional Cooperation Council, which is a joint body uh, comprised of uh, seconded persons and experts coming from the region itself. Uh, well, according to them, 78% of people in Southeastern Europe say that the judicial system is not independent from political influence in their countries. So that's rather high number. And it hints again towards the main culprits uh, for our story. 71% um, of respondents do not have confidence in courts and judiciary. And that clearly has negative impact on uh, uh, not only with regard to their trust, but also with uh, uh, regards to taking their cases to the court. And uh, again, staggering 83% think that law is not applied equally uh, to everyone, meaning that, uh, and hints to the uh, uh, very high level of uh, impunity uh, among the political elites and in general ruling elites uh, in these countries. So then um, uh, just to underline again uh, and to come back to the EU integration story, uh, how does that play? Uh, the state of play is such that uh, in spite of the fact that the stabilization and association process has be been launched over a decade ago, the countries of the Western Balkans are still um, lagging behind in the rule of law reform. Um, so regardless of Romania and Bulgaria joining the EU in 2007, uh, they are still subject to specific post-accession monitoring regarding the rule of law. So they are still uh, taking, taking uh, part in the monitoring mechanism of the EU called the uh, 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 verification mechanism. Uh, and uh, the same applies to Croatia, which uh, joined in 2013. So it managed to join the European Union, uh, albeit without this post-accession monitoring tool. Uh, because in the meantime, the EU has uh, said that it has learned the lessons from the previous enlargement rounds and has decided to create this fundamentals first approach. And fundamentals first includes the rule of law, which is at the forefront of EU's interest with regard to uh, uh, performance of and, and conditions that countries wanting to become a member of the EU need to adhere. Um, and... Uh, so how does this work? Uh, if you look at the theory of Europeanization, which uh, uh, I've tried to develop, uh, you will see different, at the, at, the, at the very center, you will see different stages of this negotiating process to, for the countries to join the EU. Of course, the negotiations do not actually exist because, I mean, it's only a name. Uh, it's basically uh, take all or give up some uh, the conditions that the EU is setting for the candidate countries, including those uh, reflect, re regarding the rule of law, are not to be negotiated. So basically, the negotiations exist only in name. Uh, but what I want to actually uh, show you with this slide is how uh, there are two key actors uh, that are supposed to implement these norms uh, from below. 
you see that obviously it is the national governments that are engaged into these negotiations. Uh, and from above, it's the EU with its institutions. So often it is the technocrats sitting in Brussels um, who are negotiating these conditions with the uh, governments that are uh, actually uh, uh, often uh, showing up as gatekeeper leads, because as you will see later, uh, it is not always their best interest to actually adopt uh, and to, to implement these requirements and conditions coming from the EU. Why? Because often, as uh, you might um, know, uh, they often will be eventually called upon to actually uh, uh, respond uh, for their wrongdoings to these uh, independent institutions if they are ever set up. Uh, and this, is, this has been one of the bitter lessons for the autocrats sitting in the Western Balkan countries that they have learned from the case of Croatia. In Croatia, former Prime Minister Ivo Sanader has been the one that actually brought the country, brought the Croatia uh, to, to uh, join the European Union in 2013. Um, while doing so, he had to meet these uh, difficult conditions regarding the rule of law and has established independent, efficient, and uh, accountable uh, rule of law institutions. Uh, what happened next, obviously these institutions uh, 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 enjoyed their independence and also started investigating uh, business of the government. Uh, and soon after they have indicted, in, indicted uh, Ivo Sanader with uh, uh, charges for his embezzlement and fraud. And um, he, he, he stands at trial and is now imprisoned. So this, is an import, this was an important lesson for uh, the elites that are currently ruling the Western Balkan countries. And often uh, it drives them into becoming actually gatekeeper elites for these negotiations. So their rational choice there is not necessarily the one to say, okay, I'm gonna rush and I'm gonna fulfill all the conditions simply to get to the to the to the EU membership, because often this actually backfires at them. So that's one of the observed problems there. So um, uh, just briefly, um, the main problems uh, that are currently stalling the EU integration can be described along these four lines. So uh, still existing bilateral disputes in the region uh, that are mostly the consequence of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia and uh, violent conflicts from the 1990s, uh, internal contestations, including the statehood issues, uh, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, or between Kosovo and Serbia, uh, but also this creeping nationalization of the, of the EU integration processes as uh, uh, they have been called by Christoph Hillian. Uh, and this means that uh, it is not necessarily only these uh, Brussels technocrats that are driving the process. It is often uh, member states that have more uh, intense hands-on approach on the integration and uh, are not shy to use their veto power. Uh, and uh, just to remember ourselves uh, uh, of the recent uh, North Macedonia issue with France and then later with Bulgaria, and the same goes for Albania. So it is not even that uh, you get guarantees once you meet all the uh, conditions that you will progress to the next stage of the accession talks, because it might actually be that only one member state country has the power to veto uh, uh, this decision. And finally, it's the enlargement fatigue, which uh, somehow always keeps up popping throughout the European Union. And uh, there are surveys that show that uh, almost uh, three quarters of citizens of some EU member states are against further enlargement. Uh, it remains for us to be seen how much, and I predict that it would, but how much this ongoing uh, conflict in Ukraine might shift this uh, uh, vision of, um, and sentiment of the, of the citizens and uh, equally of the policymakers uh, in EU member states. So. Uh, on to the key findings in ca candidate countries. So despite, as I said, this, this uh, ongoing uh, reform efforts, uh, there is still widespread corruption or at least uh, prevailed corruption. Uh, and the corruption is actually 
uh, does not only include his petty corruption, but it is uh, uh, highly centralized and includes uh, all, all, all parts of the state. Uh, it is actually driven by, by the elites. Uh, and uh, in, in turn, uh, they are uh, using it to simply um, uh, create this uh, democratic facade which means that uh, yes, they are, they have adopted all these beautiful constitutions and laws that are praised by the experts and by international community. But basically behind the facade, they're just continuing with their business as usual. Uh, they're creating these networks of uh, uh, clientelism uh, and patronage, and uh, therefore they're able to impact uh, other branches of power. So the executive is impacting other branches of power, but also they're impacting and influencing media, they're inf impl impacting um, a civil society, et cetera. At the same time, there is a high tradition of impunity, as I've said, of political elites and uh, uh, just how high it is, um, um, I will just give you one illustration. There has thus far not been a single case of highly ranked politician that has been uh, uh, actually trialed and prosecuted or sentenced uh, for, for uh, uh, whatever that he or she may have done, despite of this, these affairs constantly being present in what is left of uh, independent media in the region, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and all these in turn is building up to these authoritarian tendencies. Uh, clearly, we now observe these authoritarian tendencies, uh, uh, not only us as academics, but as I have said, it is now clear uh, by observing these uh, democratic indexes, such as the Freedom Houses or Bartlesman uh, Transformation Index or uh, the Economist uh, Index of Democracy. So they are all actually showing this uh, grim picture of uh, 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 democracy in back in in uh, backsliding and uh, growing authoritarian tendencies in the countries of course there are uh, positive examples as well there are um, uh, uh, good stories from the region and uh, uh, some of them include the recent change of the government in Nor in north macedonia uh, but also in um, uh, montenegro it was believed that uh, this would never happen uh, uh, but uh, eventually the opposition with uh, a lot of problems have managed to topple uh, Milo Djukanovic and uh, 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 nonetheless the country is still being in turmoil after, after it. Uh, uh, it is a positive development actually uh, to, 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 to actually have the possibility to change the government despite of all these obstacles and control of the state and state institutions by, by the politicians. On the side of the EU, what are the key findings? Um, well, first of all, uh, and here I'm mostly concerned about the conditions that the EU is setting, but also its monitoring of the ongoing reforms. If we, if we look into the conditions, then obviously there is a lack of clarity with regard to standards. And this reflects my introduction, in, intro, introductory remark of the lack of uh, um, a uniform rule of law system within the EU. Uh, basically, unlike many economic criteria, the EU does not have these political criteria listed in its uh, or explained in its uh, treaties. It is rather a spider web of documents, regulations, uh, and even judgments of the European Court of Justice that actually creates these standards and at most of times, it is not even quite clear uh, when the EU is calling upon these European standards or best practices. So what does that actually mean? So uh, the EU should, in my opinion, produce more clear standards or more, more clear guidance to the countries of the Western Balkans or candidate countries in general when they talk about these rule of law standards so that the countries would know exactly what they are supposed to achieve and how they would supposed to behave. Secondly, the huge problem is also the lack of credibility of the integration. I mentioned uh, uh, North Macedonia, for example, has uh, done tremendous job and has done a lot 
to meet the, the not even EU imposed criteria, but in fact, bilateral conditions set upon a neighboring country, Greece. It has went so far to even change uh, changed this name. It is no longer called Macedonia, but North Macedonia. And despite of all that, uh, it is still actually vetoed uh, and is not moving forward with, with EU integration because of another uh, veto coming this time from France and uh, currently from Bulgaria. Why is, why is this uh, credibility a big issue? Because obviously the country that is performing these reforms would need to have the trust that at the end of the day, it would meet the reward, the, vo the reward being either progressing to the next stage of the accession, or in fact, and at the end of the day, meeting the, or becoming full EU member states. And if this credibility is destroyed, if this trust is missing, obviously this is gonna uh, play bad for the whole process and uh, uh, the process is gonna remain stuck in a, in a limbo. So, um, that's that's uh, uh, that's something that definitely needs to be improved on the side of the EU. And finally, when we talk about a monitoring mechanism, despite of the fact that it has been much much uh, uh, improved and uh, it has developed, uh, there is still a lot of inconsistency uh, of the monitoring process. There is a great deal of inefficiency, uh, so a lot of things uh, simply remain under the radar of the EU Commission when it monitors the um, implementation of the rule of law. Uh, for example, these smear attacks on uh, journalists, they, they have never appeared uh, in EU progress reports. Uh, also some prominent incidents that are used as a uh, actually a illustra excellent illustration for the, for the rule of law. Uh, deficiencies in the country, they never made it there. So basically the EU has to do much better job at capturing the, the problems with regard to the, to the rule of law in the Western Balkans. Now, uh, so in fact, moving forward uh, and looking to the scope that on limits, it is true that uh, this institutional and top-down approach did generate uh, quite unique uh, uh, broad-based and long-term support for the rule of law in the Western Balkans, including huge amounts of uh, euros, huge amounts of money. Um, and, but, but the fact is that uh, the EU is not able to impact the reduction of uh, veto players, so these gatekeeper leads, and to eliminate institutional obstructions and administrative obst obstructions caused by the legacies of the, of the past, so not even only communist past, but, com but, but legacy of the past from the 1990s. And as, I was, as I've said, this uh, uh, legacy of divorce and uh, uh, outright authoritarian tendencies. Uh, what is needed is an additional push. And I understand that this uh, additional push uh, needs to come from basically from below. Uh, it is this bottom up soft socialization mechanisms that are not used equitably enough. And I always like to recall on uh, uh, quite prominent uh, uh, expert, quite prominent political scientist, uh, Ivan Krastev, who, who calls upon this sandwich approach. And he says that if you know, democracy or the rule of law would be the substance that you want to eat and you want to place it in the sandwich, then you need to press from both sides. Uh, from above, this would be the EU that uh, needs to uh, increase the pressure, to increase the fire on the, uh, on, the, on the elites to do their job better. But from above, uh, um, it would have to be the, the domestic uh, uh, pressure and uh, it should be applied by the civil society, it should be applied by democratic citizens, and it should be uh, uh, applied by, by the experts. Uh, of course, uh, that's easy to say, but uh, the fact is that these are at the same time, uh, the institutions and individuals that are under the pressure and under fire from the same uh, political elites in their respective countries. So basically it is needed, it is necessary to provide them with the assistance uh, not only the expert advice and expert assistance, but also financial assistance uh, uh, and at times even, you know, protection um, for just simply doing their job. So the outcome, uh, if I may, 
uh, go further of the EU's approach uh, to promotion of the rule of law in the Balkans is quite redistributive. Uh, it is capacity related, so it focuses on uh, 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 decreasing the backlog of cases in courts or to uh, build up new uh, facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's capacity related, and it's also short-term um, outcomes rather than sustainable and transformative change. So in this regard, the story has not much changed uh, so since, for example, 2004 enlargement round, where obviously. Uh, some level of success has been achieved, but uh, on the long run, these countries have not become uh, much better in performing uh, uh, with regard to the rule of law and uh, just remind ourselves uh, of, of uh, what, what is happening now in Poland with uh, their constitutional court or in Hungary where uh, the president Viktor Orban uh, has declared uh, the goal of his Fidesz party to actually create an illiberal democracy. Uh, uh, system in in the country, uh, so uh, to 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 make it even more clear and more blunt, I'm again going to quote a colleague of mine, Martin Mendelsky, who says that the EU pretends to reform, while aspiring member states pretend to be reformed, in order to advance into the accession process. Uh, that is obviously maybe too harsh, but at the same time. Uh, not not too far from the truth, and uh, uh, unfortunately, this is the situation as we have it. Uh, but again, just briefly, why uh, are we finding ourselves in in uh, this situation? And I'm gonna fast forward uh, these these couple of slides because of the uh, obviously time limit that we are having in this uh, presentation. So the the main driving force for democracy and rule of law and reform in the Western Balkans has been EU integration. And this attraction has been powerful over the past years, but the ability to provide an incentive for countries to reform uh, and to strengthen their, their institutions and uh, uh, to create these liberal democratic governments has always been limited uh, at, uh, uh, in the past. So it has been limited at the best of times. And now it, it is definitely, we can all agree, it's not the best of times. Uh, why? Because obviously in the recent months, uh, Europe and the world have moved from one existential crisis to another. Uh, they have moved, moved into great uncertainty. And this uncertainty is, has threatened to unravel some of the pillars of the stability of the European continent. Just to remind ourselves, we, Europe has been dealing with the crisis of Eurozone, the crisis of Euro, the Brexit crisis. Uh, the, the uh, unprecedented wave, waves of migration from the Middle East and North Africa uh, and uh, uh, COVID crisis. And uh, the latest is obviously the war in its immediate neighborhood in Ukraine. So what is this crisis within the EU then? Um, so I would say that rather than viewing this as serious of, uh, you know, uh, uh, unconnected crisis, it is the foremost a crisis of liberal democracy in, in, in European continent and wider and broader, and uh, a crisis of compromise-based decision-making and cooperation at the European level. And therefore, uh, we see growing number of countries where you see you, you, you have this groundswell of support for xenophobic and populist and anti-democratic politicians and this is clear not only within the EU, but also in Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, elsewhere. And regardless of their programs and demands uh, being very you know, country specific, uh, uh, they still have uh, much in common. And that is the ability to hold them in checks, uh, which depends on the strength of institutions and the strategies of liberal democratic forces in their countries. And uh, while the situation is such that in most of the Western uh, European democracies, uh, uh, the, these institutions, civil societies and political parties are well developed and they provide a strong, you know, you know, bulwark against these tendencies, democracies in Southeast Europe, so in the Western Balkans, are much more fragile. There are no such uh, uh, institutions. The civil societies are weak. And uh, uh, therefore, they have been, as you can see, backsliding for a decade. And uh, 
uh, uh, again, moving forward, uh, uh, my conclusion is, uh, and my question is, so how long will this crisis last in, in uh, the Western Balkans, the crisis of democracy and the rule of law? I think that the key factor is time, because uh, also we need to answer the question of how long will the crisis uh, in the EU last and um, how, how, how long and how strong will the liberal democracy be in the core EU? And uh, regardless of these, as I said, very grim um, outlooks and the news coming from the Ukraine, it might be that uh, finally uh, 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 this crisis might, uh, you know, be the, the bell that uh, will ring strongly, not only in Brussels and uh, elsewhere in DC, and uh, will be a wake up call, in fact, uh, uh, which will uh, provide uh, democratic citizens uh, with, with these uh, uh, tools uh, and mechanisms to actually prevent this backsliding into the authoritarianism and uh, will basically be a point where uh, we will say, okay, uh, we, we actually need to get back to square one and uh, see what went wrong and how we can fix it. Um, and um, of course, uh, 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 the, the, the point is that uh, this no longer can be driven from the outside or at least not exclusively, but it has to be driven from within. And uh, therefore, we need to find these actors who will be uh, the decisive uh, factor to, 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 play a, to, to play this role. And uh, what, I'm, what I always say is that uh, it, I believe strongly in the role of democratic citizens and therefore uh, the support for the democratic citizens uh, in the Western Balkans is uh, my plea and uh, my key message. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, perhaps with this, uh, I, would, I would also conclude uh, and paraphrase, per paraphrase this sentence that, uh, which says democracy needs Democrats, and uh, uh, I would slightly change it and say that democracy needs democratic citizens <coughs> who will be able to fight this uh, consistent weaknesses of liberalism. And therefore, uh, again, coming back to this cartoon by, by Predra Koraksic Koraks, uh, this lady justice does need a fix, uh, but it's not going to be a quick fix, obviously. Uh, it's going to take some time, uh, but at least I'm hoping that the time comes when we will have a clear prescription of what exactly needs to be done. So apologize for going slightly over the time limit, and thank you for uh, bearing with me. And uh, yeah, perhaps uh, open up for Q&A. Thank you very much, Martha. <laughs> thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. Thank you. That was, was really. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you stop sharing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for this really informative talk. Um, it's you're maybe more optimistic than I am, so that's good. We need optimism right now. Um, Indeed. <laughs> uh, Steven Siegel has a question. I'm going to let him, we're going to start with that. Thanks, Mary. And hi, Marco. I just had a really quick question for you. If you could talk a little bit more about EU institutions and the forms of transparency in, in the question of corruption and anti-corruption. So it, actually, this is very close to Mary's question about relative optimism and pessimism. So maybe if you could kind of give us a forecast as, as you see Brussels acting, I, I guess I'm really interested in country by country corruption, anti-corruption, especially as, as Kirill knows the role of NGOs. So really my question is, is the relationship between um, NGOs and sort of Brussels monitoring agencies. If you could talk a little bit more about that, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are we clustering questions or should I? No, go, uh, you can go ahead and answer and then we'll just. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a difficult question. So therefore I was <laughs> hoping to buy some more time. But uh, uh, in brief, uh, in brief, uh, 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 if I understood the question correctly, is uh, the, you were mostly cu cu curious about uh, the relationship between the civil sector and the monitoring process of the EU. And uh, uh, of course, uh, up until recently, I also had no clue because uh, uh, one of the 
problems, if if I may, um, of the EU and the all and the whole monitoring process is the lack of transparency. So where exactly are they gathering their intel? Uh, who's providing it? And uh, what do they make with it? Um, um, so th this was. Cons Pretty much, I was always arguing for for the need to improve this uh, chain of um, communication, and recently this seems to be working. But uh, uh, it works uh, to the level that uh, the EU uh, gathers uh, regularly the experts coming from the candidate countries or meets them in their countries, uh, discusses the matter of the corruption, so the TI and uh, other local. Uh, uh, agents, uh, but then again, um, it is it is really not quite clear what they do and how they distill this information, because as I have said, uh, at a lot of times uh, the the very important elements uh, of state capture of corruption they're not displayed in this monitoring mechanism. Uh, so the progress reports and why, uh, because and I'm going to be quite clear. I, I mean I. I do understand this is Chatham House, but at the same time, I'm aware of this is being recorded. But uh, so I'm not going to, you know, name names. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the, the 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 same struggle that the actual people who are writing these progress reports have. Uh, uh, what we get to read at the very end is not the original paper they have written, because each of these progress reports needs to be approved by each of the 27. Uh, EU member states, and uh, uh, at all times they have uh, different uh, demands, such as tone down or uh, uh, leave these out or, um, or whatever you want to have it. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, uh, the EU is normally using this very low tone uh, 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 diplomatic language, soft dip diplomatic language, which uh, at the end of the day, does not please uh, those those same people who provided this intel in the region, uh, including myself. Uh, and uh, the best signal that the EU actually does have a clue of what's going on is exactly this 2018 communication strategy in which they stepped out of these uh, uh, comfortable shoes and uh, basically said, oh, "Look, this is this is just wrong." Uh, the governments have displayed this not only corruption but uh, close ties with criminal organizations. So I mean that's that's pretty straight out. Uh, the trouble is they have never followed up on that in any of the uh, uh, forthcoming uh, progress reports. So there we have it. Thank you for the forthright answer. That's exactly what I wanted. Thank you. Okay, let's turn to uh, Michael Keel has a question. Can you all hear me? So, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Headphones. So, um, yeah. Thank you for uh, your your presentation. Uh, I'm a graduate student here at UT Austin, um, and I've done some like research on the accession process. And um, yeah, one one thing I was curious about, like I do think, um, even though I support like the EU's work and like the US's work in the region, that like solutions have to be local um, and that we need like really like Western Balkan people uh, invested in leading a lot of these, um, I mean, building democracy in the region and, and so forth. And so my question is is a little bit more general. And I, I am curious in this context that people sort of are unsure when the, the chapters will move forward and how long the session process will take. Um, last year, there was this open Balkan initiative that sought to create like a little bit more cooperation among countries in the region. And so now it's, I think Serbia, North Macedonia and Albania. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious what you, what you thought about that potentially. And then also, I mean, what it might require to be more successful than the same elites like working together as you see during the, the integration process at the moment. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, well, at the same time, it, it is one of the conditions uh, by the EU to improve this bilateral and regional cooperation in the in the region. So, um, uh, but, but by that book, uh, nothing wrong with the Open Balkans initiative. Uh, obviously, it is welcome, uh, uh, and uh, it is not the first. Uh, there, there, there has been this Berlin 
a process which uh, was pretty much the the same thing but it was driven from the outside uh, it, the, the 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 mother of the of the idea was angela merkel uh, 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 and now she's gone and uh, apparently so might be the berlin process we don't know yet uh, but it is good news to have this locally driven initiative the only problem i mean not the only problem but the main problem is uh, that again um, not all the countries from the region have the same leverage there and the process seems to be driven mostly by Serbia and that necessarily means that uh, Kosovo stays out uh, uh, unfortunately so that 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 is the uh, key problem that I see with the open Balkan uh, you know if you really want to have it open then everyone's welcome um, and uh, uh, therefore that 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 would be my my you know, I would welcome it. Uh, it is a good initiative uh, with clear goals, and uh, it provides the, the very idea is to actually uh, um, display the readiness of the re countries of the region to join the EU by adopting the same set of principles, so the free trade, free movement of citizens. So we can do that. Yes, we're ready. But then, you know, then every everyone should participate in that. Thank you, Marco, uh, and thank you, Michael, for, um, mm. you know, Michael is modest, actually, he, he, his main research actually is, and his thesis is concentrated on, on the Balkans as we speak. Um, with this, I would like to ask uh, uh, Marco to um, answer a question that will be fielded by Venelin Bochev. Venelin, uh, could you please also introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Uh, so I'm Benjamin Bochev. I'm a, I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the Free University of Brussels. And my question is regarding, I wanted to ask you, uh, Marco, what you think of the process of how uh, rule of law reforms are adopted in the, in the, in the Western Balkans, but also more broadly, uh, more broadly in Southeast Europe. Because I get, uh, as you mentioned, now the monitoring process has become uh, has become uh, more comprehensive. There has been a larger impetus, or like rural uh, reform promotion has uh, improved since, uh, uh, yeah, de definitely since uh, the Bulgarian and Romanian accession. But at the same time, I the fact that I get this feeling that a lot of these reforms are adopted by, let's say, by urgent legislative procedures, or they are adopted during the during a parliamentary boycott. And yeah, I wanted to ask you this because I think that although the rule of law, it's something that's supposed to be somehow not related to the daily political life, fundamentally rule of law reforms are adopted at first by politicians. And I, and I get this feeling sometimes that we're missing out on how we adopt uh, these rule of law reforms. Mm -hmm. So this is my question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent question. Um, and of course, this, this, the question signals uh, exactly this interplay between democracy and rule of law, which I did not get to speak much, um, um, but you're quite right to, to pinpoint on that, um, uh, because everything that you've said uh, points out to this uh, uh, democratic deficit in these countries. Uh, so the urgent procedures, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, extraordinary sessions of the parliament, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but not only that, it's actually the, the, the pressure by the executive to the parliamentary uh, uh, groups to uh, go one way or the other, etc. So uh, the, the general, the, also the lack of uh, public discussion on urgent laws that are being passed or even constitutional amendments. Uh, so this all points um, um, elsewhere. Not 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 only the I mean the rule of law is the the outcome, but this is the lack of uh, and deficiency in um, uh, a general democratic procedures. And the lack of democratic deficit, the democratic deficit, in fact, in these countries, uh, and uh, democratic practice, which is missing. Uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, uh, so we are we are clear on that, uh, and you have absolutely pointed that correctly. But the EU is simply not concerned about it. Uh, it does not even. I don't think that even cares, uh, uh, because every time the, the new law is passed, uh, you will see uh, praises coming from the Brussels and from 
uh, uh, the politicians of EU member states who just say, yes, uh, you did a good job, you, you're complying to the, to the demands, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, the adoption of the laws does not necessarily mean or does not guarantee for the implementation. So uh, you're right, uh, uh, you've noticed it much better than the EU did. Uh, uh, yet, uh, the problem is even bigger because it's not only about laws. I've said, uh, uh, you know, we can we can maybe even agree that these laws are good, uh, that they, they're improving the situation uh, with regard to, let's say, uh, independence of judiciary, with regard to latest, uh, uh, these latest amendments of the constitution in Serbia. But the fact is, you know, who cares? Uh, because the, we all know uh, the situation is going to remain un unchanged, uh, 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 and uh, these these uh, uh, makeup, uh, you know, amendments uh, are not going to. They're just going to, you know, paint the facade, and the, beyond the facade, things are going to remain the same. Sorry for being now grim. And oh no, <laughs> let's go to Elena. There, there have been some yeah. complaints about me being optimistic. <laughs> I wasn't complaining. I was just pointing no, it out. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, Elena Shuvalova has her hand up. Elena, would you like to ask your introduce Thank yourself? You so yes, I, I'm I'm Elena from from the new school. I have I have read my master. Uh, this is on Mil Milovan Gilles's new class and in, in this ap application nowadays. And uh, hence, my uh, question will be also connected with uh, Gilles's ideas. Uh, Marco, you, you gave a great uh, analysis of our European Union as uh, one of the elite political institutions. Uh, but uh, if Gilles was was alive, uh, maybe he had called these uh, um, these changes happening with uh, your your European Union, uh, the um, political bureaucracy, because what you are speaking about is uh, um, not. Not about li li liberal democracies and uh, not not about uh, the rule of law, uh, but you you use the words uh, pretend to change and 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 I I completely agree with your est estimation or with your ev evaluation of these changes because I think that are uh, uh, trying to accept the new members under the. Uh, principles uh, of uh, uh, changing of leg legislation, the European Union uh, undermines its core values. I mean, hum human rights and the, the rule of law. Excuse me if I if I'm too wordy, but am I am I right? And uh, was Gilles right with the uh, with the matter of political bureaucracy? Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. I, I have to say that I'm not an expert. That, that, that would be, I mean, it would require some uh, historical perspective, which I did not have because I'm not, you're obviously much more familiar with uh, the work of Milo and Gilles than I am. Um, and I can learn from you. So I would appreciate it. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, pretty much opposing the, uh, um, Authoritarian structure of the communist uh, regime in former Yugoslavia, and uh, of course there there could be some parallels uh, uh, built up there. But I'm simply not a person to answer that question, and I would have to apologize myself. Thank you, Marco. Um, if you mind, uh, if you don't mind, actually, I will try to step in. And um, I was thinking, you know, first of all, thank you for this very interesting, in-depth, and provocative. Uh, uh, presentation because it, it touches on many points in, in our professional conversations uh, regarding the Balkans, uh, anywhere from uh, abuse and abuse and weaponization of history, as in the case of Bulgaria and Macedonia, North Macedonia, for instance, uh, all the way to economic conditions and improving. You know, so it's kind of cutting across all the topics. And I'm very glad that you have mentioned something, an, an author, 
uh, that I enjoy reading his prov provocative works uh, beyond the fact that, uh, you know, being a compatriot. Uh, so yeah. he wrote a book, uh, Ivan Krustov, it is. Uh, yeah. so he wrote, uh, wrote a very interesting piece, and I want you to comment specifically for the case of, um, and I'll make a metaphor, you know, for the case of uh, the Western Balkans. So if we go back to step from game theoretical perspective, and we think through his paradigm of um, uh, the imitation game. And that is, you know, uh, you have noticed in your slides as well, uh, you know, local elites and sometimes the masses, you know, follow strategies, game theoretical strategies to imitate change in order to comply with the conditionality. Whereas on the other side, the, you know, elites in Brussels also are accepting that, uh, you know, this mimicry, you know, that, uh, as you said, you know, democracy needs democr democ mm -hmm. uh, democratic procedures and democratic citizens. Uh, so both sides, you know, participate in this equilibrium. So hence my provocative question to you would be the following. So if I put my shoes right now, which is big shoes to fill, <laughs> you know, crust of shoes, and I would say that if we see that across the Balkans, we're seeing, you know, those strategies of imitation in order to appease and, uh, you know, avoid the stick and get the carrot, uh, let's limit this to the elites. What incentives specifically would have the people that are penalized by following the rules in Western Balkans and being economic losers, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Because yeah. obviously corruption and state capture is a lucrative business. And obviously if you don't have judiciary working, uh, you know, following the rules makes you look like a fool <laughs> in certain aspects. Uh, so what what's, what's your perspective? And I know this is really <laughs> strong and I'm measuring my words as well because it's recorded. But I know this sentiment, which is very, very strong, you know, like across the region uh, and having in mind, as you mentioned, that uh, the conditionality and verification mechanism still stands for, for uh, you know, Bulgaria and Romania, which have joined, you know, much, much earlier. And yet we are still with this, uh, you know, in this situation. Does that mean that we've reached, you know, sort of the maximum that could be, you know, achieved uh, and will continue to, you know, outlast each other or out imitate? Yeah, uh, provocative indeed. Uh, but thanks, thanks. Uh, th 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 that is an excellent question. And uh, th there are now two layers to it. Uh, uh, the first, uh, maybe you did not even <laughs> aimed into that direction, but I, I believe it needs to be said because uh, obviously it's not only the, the EU and us and uh, the politicians that understand where this all is going. Uh, so at fir the, my first part of the answer concerned the uh, general sentiment of the citizens. Uh, so these, as you say, economic losers and those who actually um, suffer from these deficiencies of the law, rule of law who do not benefit from them. Uh, so what do they actually think about the EU now? Uh, do they, I mean, are, are they still, you know... You're optimistic, that is, yeah. Exactly, cool. yeah. I mean... Uh, uh, they are ob they are obviously getting pretty much disillusioned about uh, this promise of the EU, and uh, uh, they are pretty much uh, you know saying, okay, but, but this carrot is not even you know tasty. Uh, <laughs> let's go for the burger elsewhere, uh, and and basically, uh, yeah, it's playing out so that uh, these same elites and citizens who are supposed to be uh, the allies of the EU uh, within this endeavor, they are simply becoming Eurosceptics. They are not necessarily turning elsewhere. It's not about looking for the alternatives because for them it's clear that Russia or Turkey or Middle East, th those are not viable alternatives. It's just uh, dissatisfaction with uh, the way EU is doing it. it it's the things and and also, it's the understanding that the EU is not capable of dealing with similar issues within its own yard. So, uh, again, Hungary and uh, Poland, but also over the older EU member states, such as Italy and Greece. Um, let's not fool, so fool ourselves. So that's one part of it. And the second, uh, with regard to these uh, uh, domestic practices and uh, their resentment towards the elites, uh, I think it's growing. 
I, I think that it is really growing and uh, they're understanding uh, what is going on. And uh, it leads to these uh, uh, social mobilization, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, comes up like every, I guess, it, annual in annual cycles. Uh, yeah, it, is, uh, it seems to be cycl cyclical mobilizations that exactly yeah but 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 then the problem is what to do with this energy once once it's gathered because again i'm gonna look into the story of north macedonia and perhaps some lessons that that that, that could have been learned uh because the change of government was only i i, I say it, it was only possible due to these uh, 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 they, they called it colorful revolution. So, revolution. Uh, revolution. So the ga gatherings of the citizens for months and months and persistence of them being on the street and pushing it and pushing and pushing. But what was needed was, again, a political push. So someone who would actually contest in a political arena the uh, ruling elites. And finally, the push from the outside. Uh, and uh, it came from the United States and from the EU and most notably by the uh, uh, this... Uh, EU-led initiative uh, called the PRIBE uh, 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 Commission, uh, led by, by a constitutional court lawyer from Germany, Reinhard PRIBE. So it was a sum of little things uh, that needs to, to actually happen at the same time, simultaneously. And only then uh, this, this, uh, uh, these citizens who see it all and understand it all actually do have a chance because otherwise they will easily be silenced either by force or by simply or uh, a smear campaign against uh, individuals and uh, whatnot. And the, the, their, their energy would simply, you know, over the time, it would uh, dissolve itself and uh, would have to wait for the next cycle. And the second thing, if, if I may, I mean, the second thing is uh, the question of what to do with these uh, social movements, because also... The, the, there are some lessons to be learned uh, with regard to their institu institutional institutionalization um, uh, and uh, the question of what to do with the plenums in Bosnia, what to do with these uh, protests in Serbia and whatnot. So th there is this growing understanding now because a lot of these citizens are equally disappointed with the, the, the alternatives, political alternatives, so the opposition. And now they're coming to, 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 to turn that, in fact, they would need to uh, uh, politically organize themselves and to challenge uh, both the uh, political elites and the opposition uh, in a political contestation. So to go to the elections and try to, to secure some votes. Uh, again, for those of you interested, I think that a good comparison can be drawn from uh, the case of Croatia and uh, the the uh, coalition uh, Mojemo, uh, which means we can, that first took uh, the city of Zagreb, and now they're competing on a national level, and they're becoming they're becoming actually a, 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 a crucial player uh, in Croatian political uh, arena. Thank you very much, Marco. I know that this was a lot, and it was really provocative, but I'm I'm glad that you've taken on because. Frankly, you know that those conversations uh, are not only among, you know, academic walls. Uh, it is a daily conversation, uh, at least, you know, in my friends' networks and everyone's friend, uh, friendly networks. And uh, we know that uh, the region was rocked by massive protests. Bulgaria's politics was transformed. Macedonian politics was transformed. Uh, mm -hmm. So th th those were tectonic shifts. And I agree with you that uh, small things need to be present to add up, to break the cycle. Uh, otherwise, you know, the equilibrium as way back as uh, Hellman, uh, you know, defined what state capture is for in his seminal paper, you know, like in 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. uh, they stay the same and simply there is no counterbalance in order to tip, uh, you know, this, this really negative equilibrium where actually you know, the people that are able to state capture and grab state resources are the winners and they're the role models. Everybody else seems to be, you know, as a sort of sore loser, right? You know, I mean, you follow the rules and so what? Uh, and then either you have to co-opt or immigrate. And I'm, and I'm thinking this with a, on the back of my hand, uh, head, uh, how relevant, you know, the conversation that we're having here today is the situation in, with Russian intellectuals and middle class 
which is facing similar dilemma. So it's, it's either, you know, well, not similar in a sense yeah. because this regime is something qualitatively else, but, you know, in terms of game theoretical, either co-opt or flight, you know, I mean, you don't have too many options left on the table unless you don't want to be crushed by the system or margin, marginalized. And uh, yeah. I think that EU needs to understand very deeply uh, that some of those um uh, some of those processes need to be supported on time before the momentum is yeah. lost because gathering momentum and a lot of our students here at UT <clears throat> do those researches. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it takes a lot of time and th those are life years of people that live there in quality of, of, of life. Uh, and that could have, you know, very serious consequences, just as is what we see in Ukraine, you know, is how people, you know, been waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, it's a moving target, you know, and I know that both sides here, of course, you know, there's a larger conversation about that. Yep. Uh, so thank you, Marco. Mary? <clears throat> um, yeah, I have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, so one is I, I'm interested in this concept, I guess, of the rule of law, which it, it seems to me like it should be a basic kind of pillar of liberal democracy. But I have to say, I was so shocked how quickly it seemed to crumble in the American perception in terms of our own politics, where suddenly it just doesn't matter if certain high-placed politicians trample on the rule of law quite openly. And it that those particular people, Donald Trump, uh, don't lose support at all, but actually gain it and his supporters double down. And it's like, so maybe it's not as kind of core value as one would think um, for liberal democracy, or at least, or perhaps it's just a backsliding that's happening here as well. Um, so I was thinking about the surveys you were talking about. Um, and I was wondering if you ever asked even like, is the rule of law important? I mean, is the rule of law something that, you know, because I think you were asking more like, is the rule of law in place? Is it being followed? That kind of thing. But I also wonder what, how those surveys might fare in places like the United States, where I think actually on both sides of the political spectrum, people question um, how solid our judicial system is in terms of, you know, I'm thinking of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter and things like that, in terms of actually functioning in a fair way that isn't either laid by politics or money or race or something else. Sorry, it's a big question, but I'm just trying to think like sort of globally about the notion of rule of law and within the democracies. It is, it's a huge question, but uh... Um, I'm going to try to like tackle it uh, as much as I can. Uh, well, you raised a very important question, and that is the uh, importance for, of the rule of law for the ordinary citizens. And, uh, you know, if, if you remember, and I'm going to, I cannot stress it enough. I mean, uh, it is not even clear for the experts, uh, and there is no, not an universal definition of what the rule of law is uh, but there is a general understanding and consensus among, uh, on the importance of the rule of law and in this regard uh, if i may i would compare it to uh, uh, the air uh, it is not only important it is crucial it, we need it without air we cannot breathe and i think that without the rule of law uh, all the economic transactions between citizens could not take place. Uh, uh, the government could not rule because they would not be held accountable, et cetera, et cetera. But why these, so why the air and the rule of law are similar? Uh, basically, you only understand how important one is once you miss it, once you don't have it anymore. Uh, and th this is exactly what, what, what is actually happening. Uh, in, in the U.S., uh, as you have uh, just uh, uh, explained on several examples, uh, uh, the rule of law is definitely has been backsliding. Uh, and it is not because the system or the institutions have changed. Uh, it, is, it, is, it has been the interruption, interruption in, in the, uh, on the political side of uh, uh, the governance uh, in the U.S. And... Uh, this clearly again demonstrate, demonstrates the, this, this relation between 
the rule of law, uh, which uh, is institutionally we can understand as the concept which is which requires functional and independent police and judiciary and uh, uh, prosecution, uh, but also its dependence on the democracy as such. And it, it, I would I would say that in the U.S. it has not been the rule of law, but rather democracy that has been uh, backsliding and backtracking uh, for actually the same reasons I've described elsewhere. So this lack of democratic uh, consensus, a lack of uh, compromise-based decision-making and uh, uh, this, this groundswell of uh, uh, xenophobic and authoritarian uh, leaders who are trying to capture it all. Uh, but you know, luckily the institutions uh, in the US are much more resilient to such practices. And of course, not everything is bright and not everything is perfect, but uh, I mean, um, look, uh, there have been elections and uh, uh, the system has changed, uh, or at least the government, the government has changed in the US. And uh, uh, this is precisely what uh, uh, differs the US and some of the older, uh, so Western EU member states than the Western Balkan countries. Uh, uh, in the US, you still have very strong uh, civil society. Uh, the universities, to my knowledge, have not been under threat. Uh, media uh, are not all media are free, of course. Uh, some are biased, but there are independent media and people who would report about what's going on. And all this is not necessarily always the truth uh, uh, in, in, in some of the countries uh, that we have been discussing. So that's the main difference. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it bring, brings us to the seminal question of how to maintain the system and how to empower it, how to, how to you know, give it fresh air. Uh, and uh, the answer is like all of these windows that we are seeing. So you and everyone else, the, the democratic citizens who will, uh, if nothing else, just go out to vote and make a change. Well, as a quick point of clarity, our Lieutenant Governor just told UT, our university is coming after us and we weren't gonna be able to teach critical race theory anymore. Uh -huh. um, so I don't think that's gonna actually happen, but those threats are, I mean, he tweeted that out. So <laughs> he raised quite a stir and it's already okay, been so banned. It's been banned through in K through 12 schools already in our state. Yeah. So yeah, so there's some of that going on, but still you're right. You're totally right. Um, I guess I just have one last question and that is in terms of your optimism um, and, and how does the EU fit into that? Like, is the EU the answer as we can see? I mean, should, is it good for the EU, EU to expand into the Western Balkans? And is it good for those countries to be become part of the EU? Or is the EU just pretending to want them in and they're pretending to want in? <laughs> um, because the EU also brings certain difficulties, I think, to these countries as they join, and certainly they bring difficulties to the EU, vice versa. So that's mm -hmm, my mm -hmm. final, that's our final yeah. question today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, um, I mean, it's geopolitics, but at the same time, um, I'm going to come back to this promise that has been given by the, by the, uh, from the EU to the Western Balkans in 2003, and that was the clear promise that these countries will enter the EU, uh, uh, granted they meet these accession conditions. So uh, I think it's happening. But uh, uh, And what are the reasons uh, on the side of the EU besides uh, actually completing this European project, uh, the peace project, as it has been envisaged in the... In the uh, it's very... Um, uh, um, in its infancy. Uh, I think that uh, a lot has to do with uh, uh, security, a lot has to do with uh, 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 economy, and uh, ultimately uh, about uh, EU values, because uh, the EU values would actually be the, those of inclusion and uh, uh, also interreligion and uh, whatnot. And uh, by, by actually getting the Balkans in, they would demonstrate that it lives by these uh, values, not only that it has them listed somewhere and they're like a thick box, but they actually do exist. 
But I think that the, the, the biggest incentive would in fact be this uh, geopolitical uh, security because we see that uh, uh, at the same time the EU is not, not anymore the only player in town. It used to be uh, at the end of the 1990s, not anymore. Nowadays you have uh, other global players such as Russia and uh, China and uh, uh, Emirates and uh, countries from the Middle East that are uh, prominently featured, uh, the US as well, that are prominently featured in the, in the region and uh, uh, often they are uh, uh, investing a lot of money or uh, providing a lot of loans and therefore uh, they are taking uh, the pressure off uh, the, these elites to actually comply with EU's demands because you know they can look for the price elsewhere in terms of these at least finances. Uh, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, it can be said that uh, it, it might be a trap as well for these countries because they, you know, uh, let's let's not fool, us, fool ourselves. They might be just uh, a perfect. Uh, 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 a way for Putin to actually keep the Europeans busy elsewhere and uh, provide a new crisis uh, somewhere in the region. Uh, so all the reasons are there to, for this process, process to continue and to be finalized. And again, I like to provide these illustrations or illustrative examples. It has been the former Serbian president who was actually the opponent of the integration. And he once said, oh, I don't care if this whole process ends. Uh, the EU will just be a, a beautiful, you know, carpet. It'll be a beautiful carpet, but in the middle of it, there will be this gaping hole and this will be Serbia. So, I mean, at, he, he was right. If the project actually does finish without including the Balkans, then, you know, it'll just have this hole and the carpet will be good for nothing. Thank you, Marco. Um, we said that you know we will be you know closing, but since I see uh, that Dan and I'm going to ask him to introduce himself has raised a hand, would you would you be able to take one more, please? Question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marco. Dan. Yeah, thank you, Kirill. Um, I'm a I'm a law student here at the University of Texas. Um, I guess kind of picking up on you kind of answered my question in the course of your previous answer. Um, but I guess what I'm most curious about is you see, like you look at the 2018 enlargement strategy and stuff like that, there's a lot of discussion of very granular uh, kind of issues on sort of law enforcement cooperation, migration enforcement, things like that. Um, and I was just curious um, on, about your read on sort of how do or how do these sorts of um, kind of discrete kind of very focused uh, initiatives uh, impact? Um, again, echoing, I think, Carol's question, incentives for folks who may or may not be uh, interfacing with EU institutions and, and other uh, member state institutions uh, in law enforcement and career bureaucrats, for example, in, in Western Balkan countries? And how does that affect, um, you know, the public's sort of day-to-day -day interface uh, with, you know, these larger questions of public law and what is your perception of, you know, these sort of granular, uh, you know, subsidiary issues? Mm -hmm. So that, 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 this is actually, actually an excellent question, uh, which brings me to, to mention something that I maybe should have earlier. And uh, uh, one of these, one of the vivid examples of uh, uh, such intervention by the EU was uh, uh, concerned the uh, asylum policy and border control in the Western Balkans. And this was apparently an important issue for the EU and uh, it insisted on this uh, very much. But in order to be to make sure that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the countries of the Balkans would comply to these demands, they came up with, they devised something of an uh, innovative strategy, which uh, uh, was described as uh, uh, policy conditionality. Uh, what I mean by this, they said, okay, you got to reform your, let's say, border control. So to include civilian oversight, uh, uh, to equip your border posts uh, with the latest high tech, whatnot. Uh, but if you do that, uh, then we will uh, just strip you of your visa requirements and you, then you can travel freely. And guess what? It worked perfectly. Uh, 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 the citizens were pushing for it because they were eager to travel without the hustle of getting visa. And politicians have seen the opportunity to gain, uh, 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 well, I wouldn't call them cheap, but to, to gain political points uh, domestically. So this was a perfect example how, in fact, these uh, uh, policies with, related to, 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 to law implementation, how it worked uh, just, you know, smooth and perfect. Uh, the only trick is uh, a lot of people came to think of 
what else could be uh, such a you know intermediate carrot um, so how to establish this policy conditionality so you do this now and immediately you get rewarded uh, but the thing is like uh, all these brilliant minds uh, fail to to come up with something similar to that uh, uh, and yeah uh, a challenge for you i guess well, thank you so much, Marco, for this wonderful talk. And thank you to everyone in the audience for your great questions and this great conversation today. A um, little bit of optimism. <laughs> Cautious optimism some, never hurts. Some pessimism as well. Um, but thank you so much for everyone for coming. And let's we give Marco a hand. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity. It has been a great experience. We are very glad to have you, and we are very actually happy to have our first speaker, you know, with a similar institution as our center, such as the grad, University of Graz, mm -hmm. which we respect a lot. Uh, it is important, and we're looking forward, you know, to, to have you as part of the circle uh, mm -hmm. as it uh, continues with uh, those topics. And also, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to see that today, uh, the circle enlarges across uh, other units at our university, UT Law. Thank you. Uh, you know, of seeing uh, our students, but also, of course, guests all across, uh, uh, because I see, you know, representation again from multiple countries. It means that circle, the circle is meaningful and provides good information to to people that work on issues on, on our region. But again, as uh, what we, with Professor Neuberger always state with a wider applica applicability, uh, and we insist on that. We think that there is a lot, not only from historical, but even recent perspective that could be gained uh, when people deal with others. We're not saying we're better. We're just saying that uh, <laughs> the unusual complexity of the region provides us with uh, multiple entry points for analysis. So Marco, you have given us an excellent analysis. Thank you very much for, for coming uh, all the way from Austria tonight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure indeed.